I'm Herson Borrero, editor at large at City and State, and in this interview on our TV uh, platform, we have uh, the distinct honor of receiving one of uh, the leaders of the congressional delegation from New York City, Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez, Nidia Margarita Velasquez, who I always put in the middle name because Puerto Ricans have a tendency to do that. Congresswoman, thank you for taking time out. It is summer, but things are really heating up with regards to the matters that are left in Washington, D.C. The financial situation that is being right now really shocking everyone in terms of Puerto Rico, $70 billion in debt, some people as much as $72 billion. And give us a sense of what it is. Were you shocked by this reality uh, or did you see this coming? You know the government of Puerto Rico. You've represented it very well, even though it's not a part of the, the seventh congressional district. Give us a, your, your appreciation of what's happened. Well, Kirsten, let me just say, this didn't surprise me and it shouldn't surprise many people. The problem is that here in the United States, we know so little about what's going on in Puerto Rico, despite the fact that Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. Um, this financial crisis has been year in the making, so it, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, we're talking at least since the repeal of 936, that was an economic tool uh, to incentivize investment in Puerto Rico. Uh, as you know, because of transportation costs and energy, it's really expensive to do business in Puerto Rico. Therefore, it is uh, uh, required to put forward some kind of mechanism that will attract uh, public, uh, investment in Puerto Rico. And uh, the IRS and the Ways and Means Committee and the Congress provided a tool that was uh, 936. Uh, American corporations will be exempted from paying taxes, federal taxes, if they uh, invested in Puerto Rico and created jobs. And that was part of the IRS code, which then incentivized all that investment, which was really literally in the billions of dollars. Oil refineries were built. There were thousands of jobs. And uh, pharma. The pharmace pharmaceutical industry was That's big in Puerto Rico. So once that was repealed back in 1996, it was grandfathered for 10 years, uh, coming to an end basically in 2006. And that coincided with uh, the housing crisis uh, that started much earlier in Puerto Rico than it was that it, it, it happened here in the United States. So, and then when the capital markets uh, collapsed, 2007, 2008, 2009, in the United States, that was, that really sent shockwaves into the Puerto Rican economy because access to credit became non-existent. Uh, the value of the, the how, uh, how, um, the housing prices went down and uh, much of the people who were homeowners had, uh, owed more than the value of their homes, not having then any type of liquidity uh, to access capital and, and to spend money. So between the pharmaceuticals, which were really held on much more than the oil refineries because they fed off to other places where it was more profitable. The 936, you, you're tracing, interesting, you're tracing back the economic down, uh, spiral, the spiral. Yes. Uh, downward spiral to that point of 1996, which in reality there were Puerto Rican state side, our community who at that point wasn't as big as now, really lobbying Congress to be able to leave the section 936 of the Internal Revenue Code present so that it, the, the economy could keep growing. So you make a direct connection to that. So there was a, you can actually say that there was a terrible mistake for not only the United States, Puerto Rico, and the companies that benefited from it. Well, since uh, the United States government didn't then replace that model okay. with anything, 
or at least instead of repealing it, why they didn't reform it. So that those corporations uh, were asked to contribute more either to Puerto Rico, the Puerto, Ricans, the Puerto Rican economy, or the United States Treasury. But to eliminate it completely and leaving the economy in a vacuum was not wise. And let me tell you why. Because Puerto Ricans since um, 10 years ago have been leaving the island by 1%. So with, we have a choice to make whether we improve the conditions, the economic conditions, so that people in Puerto Rico can stay there and get a decent job, or they're going to come to Florida and New York, and with that comes human services, uh, social services, more kids in the school, so we're going to pay later. So that we're clear, and a lot of people that are seeing this may not realize that Puerto Ricans since 1917, are U.S. citizens since 1898, North American troops invaded Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. took over the island, imposed themselves as the government to respond to. They colonized Puerto Rico. Some people accept that term as a fact. And yet now they find themselves in a position in, with a colony uh, in which they took over, gave, made us citizens, and now are not acting in a responsible way when they've impacted negative, in a negative way yeah. to the overall economic, yeah. uh, 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 I guess, growth that, that we were having. So, so how does it, so that people understand. But it's deeper and more complex than just that. How it, so? It, it, it is based on structural problems, not cyclical issues. Okay. It's not only a slow economy, but uh, the output has been contracting dramatically in, in Puerto Rico for the, for the last decade. And you have like uh, policies, federal policies, that have a negative impact because it doesn't, it, they are applied as any other state with, with total disregard. Such that as? We're dealing with a lot, an economy that is so, so small. Is Such health? as the federal minimum wage. Okay, that's one. Okay. Um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, funding that they get. Right. That despite the fact that Puerto Ricans pay the same amount of taxes that we do in, um, in the United States, they get less funding to provide ac access to health care. Meaning that the Puerto Rican government has to pay the difference in order to provide quality health care to Puerto Ricans. Is it a political, is it, is it a political problem in terms of the partisan? For example, in the last 25 years, mm -hmm. each uh, Puerto Ricans in their infinite wisdom select one party, that being the statehood party, or then they go and do the Commonwealth Party, which is El Partido Popular Democrático or El Partido Nuevo Progresista. Does it have to do with the status condition, that being that Puerto Rico is neither a state nor an independent nation, it's el Estado Libre Asociado. A there, free there is part of that, but also the fact that when you are campaigning for governor, mm -hmm. you make all kind of promises. And if you made it and you become the governor, now you have to, uh, to honor those uh, promises. And it means borrowing money to implement a programmatic program that you presented to the people. Well, Congressman, well, wait a minute, that's a great point, but has it, isn't that what every governor has done? And except that now, why does Alejandro Garcia Padilla make this terrible political mistake that says, that's it, we got to stop kicking down the, the debt, we got to, mm -hmm. why is he, I mean, it's a terrible political risk. Yeah, uh, the deficit that Puerto Rico faced right now is much larger than they predicted and the revenues that are coming in are contracting. So they don't have the public corporations, the public utilities, PREPA, that is the power authority, and the water sewage uh, corporation, they have tomorrow, they have to pay creditors $400 million that they do not have. Tomorrow being July 1st, we're, Correct. we're talking here, 1st. we're talking June 30th, and July 1st they meet, they're supposed to meet they an obligation. They need to meet their credit obligation by paying $400 million. Right now, and, and the so the, pres uh, the, the governor said, we don't have the money, and uh, therefore we need uh, 
to continue to provide uh, basic services to the people of Puerto Rico, whether it is health care or electricity. And therefore, we need to have a mechanism that will bring us to the table and negotiate with the creditors uh, restructuring the public debt. So by midnight tonight, and I know that they are in negotiations right now, they have a choice to make, and that is to default or for these uh, creditors to agree to delay payment on those debts. Will that help? Uh, or is it, it just it, 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 it prolonging will, this It up? will buy time, uh -huh. but not, then it will be the time for the government, the federal government, once and for all to step in and take the responsibility of having a colony and saying to that colony, okay, let's get together, let's develop a comprehensive economic plan that will promote economic growth in Puerto Rico. Otherwise, uh, this is uh, fooling ourselves. Uh, Puerto Rico will not have uh, the resources to face the, the, the largest public debt that any state is facing in the nation. As a territory that's 70 or $72 billion in debt that they can't match, there's no way to do it. Um, what do you take back to Washington? You know, you go back next week. I know that you've met, I know that it, you had an off the record meeting with Senator Schumer. I'm not gonna get you into trouble, but I know you were one of the leaders of that meeting. I know you went and you were squeezing the senator. Some of it was known. Where is Senator Schumer right now? Can he help, or is it this directly something that the president must get involved in? By the way, they've already said that they're not helping Puerto Rico. Well, well Puerto Rico two, is on its Two own. things we need to do for Puerto Rico right now, and that is to provide a legal mechanism for the Puerto Rican government to negotiate their, their debt. And that, that means is, changing the law. Correct. That is uh, extending Chapter 9, bankruptcy law, to Puerto Rico. As a territory. As a territory. And two, and by the way, when you look back and you check the congressional record, I, my, I conclude that it was a mistake, that no one has any reason for not providing Chapter 9 to Puerto Rico. No one raised it. When you say no the one. congressional record, and in in Congress, in the Ways and Means Committee, Committee of Jurisdiction, uh, the uh, um, Judiciary, and you're talking now within the context of the history of Puerto Rico and the relationship, and the history so of the bankruptcy legislation. Mm -hmm. So we didn't see anyone who raised pro or con uh, in providing extending that legislation, that authority to Puerto Rico. So, so there was an unforeseen problem. And what you're now saying is that this is a reality. We must go back to that original mm -hmm. and s deal with the reality. Well, um, the delegate from Puerto Rico, Pedro Pierluisi, introduced legislation in the Judiciary Committee that will provide, uh, will extend Chapter 9 protections uh, to the government of Puerto Rico. And Senator uh, Schumer is um, ready to introduce legislation. What we need is to identify a Republican senator that will support the legislation, and we are working on that. You, so, you mean to say there's a Republican willing even to listen under the conditions? I mean, that we have right now, I think it's the 13th, Governor Christie just announced today. So you think there's a chance there that they would be understood for the greater good, not just Puerto Rico, but rather, you know, the, the, the scene that you described? Well, describe. what we need to identify is a senator who has a large concentration of Puerto Ricans in their state. And one of them is a presidential candidate today, and that is Marco Rubio. So uh, my guess is that Marco Rubio and his staff must be evaluating and they have whether or not there Florida. is political capital that he could spend right now in providing this legal authority to the Puerto Rican people in Puerto Rico. And he happens to be a senator from Florida, which is really growing by leaps and bounds in Puerto and Rican we, voters. As we all know, no presidential candidate can win uh, the Without presidential 
uh, the White House without winning Florida. And no one can win Florida without winning Central Florida. So I'm already sensing this is going to get really, really, really messy in terms of the partisan politics, which already exists in Puerto Rico. You mentioned Pedro Pierluisi. I should state for those of you that don't know what City and State TV, City and State New York, that Puerto Rico elects a resident commissioner who goes to Washington, becomes part of the Congress, is a non-voting member of the House of Representatives representing the territory of Puerto Rico. But that person does have the, you do respect his, which from wherever party sure. he or she comes, and uh, he has a voice, but not a vote. So Pedro Pierluisi is the person we're talking about. Uh, Congresswoman, um, going back to Alejandro Garcia Padilla, he says, okay, the bug stops here. We have to deal responsibly and all of that. It's going to cost him politically. Surely he didn't take that into account. He's doing the right thing. It may pay off if things work out. Right now, do you, do you see this working out in any way, shape, or form? And is the president, I know that you go and you've had lunch with people, and if not directly with the president, some top people with the, that work for the president. Is there a chance that the president will, are you planning to have a direct face-to-face -face meeting with the president? To We the, sent a letter to the president, the four members, the four Puerto members Rican of members. Puerto Rican defen, uh, descent, um, maybe two weeks ago, uh, basically discuss, uh, discussing the issue of Puerto Rico and asking for a meeting. So we are awaiting a response. But I can tell you this, that the federal government and the Secretary of the Treasury right now have a lot of leverage. They could send a strong message. Secretary Lou can pick up the phone and call all the hedge funds that purchase bonds in Puerto Rico and tell them, look, either is sitting down and um, restructuring the public debt, or the other route is for the government to default, and you're going to be embroiled in a legal battle in court for years to come. That is not good for them. It is not good for the people of Puerto Rico. Wall Street must be direly concerned. I mean, that we also have the situation in Greece. People compare, they say, oh, uh, Puerto Rico is the Greece of the Caribbean, or they say it's the Detroit of the Caribbean. There's nothing really in truth to that. The Puerto Rico is on its, it's like a unique problem situation. So I don't think people really comprehend the, the limitations that they can do by law. Is there anything that you right now, uh, I know you're talking to a lot of the New York, your colleagues in politics, both at the state legislature, at the city uh, government, the municipal government, uh, the congressional delegation, you're doing everything you can. I know that. I know you've been burning the midnight oil. What can people do? Puerto Ricans, are you, is there a campaign? I haven't heard of yet, a campaign of Puerto Rican stateside to do something to put pressure, or is that yet not needed or nobody's organizing that? Uh, there are discussions. What we are waiting to see is the willingness of the creditors to have a serious, responsible conversation with uh, the Puerto Rican government. And uh, we have to wait and see what kind of uh, outcome uh, will happen. Otherwise, then we have to regroup and see what uh, actions uh, we need to take. I know, I know already there are groups uh, that reach out to me saying we need to know who those uh, uh, hedge funds are. We want to be uh, protesting. We want to be in front of their offices uh, denouncing uh, the fact that at this time and at this crossroad, they are not willing to sit down. Like many, like many other states or jurisdictions or areas that get into this type of problem, certainly it's happened in Greece, there is a degree of waste in government that happens, and it isn't just this administration. Prior administrations to that of Alejandro Garcia Padilla, Padilla the current governor, um, had waste. Corruption is a problem also, just that it happens in, you know, in many areas and states and cities. Um, how much is the government of Puerto Rico, once if they get through this legal hump and this legal hurdle, uh, how much or have you not discussed that needs to change in the way business is done? For example, financial control board, yeah. uh, something that is 
that you in Washington, being the House and the Senate and the President, um, is there a consideration that maybe a financial control board, something like we saw in the 70s, uh, late 70s in New York City, be established to control the finances of Puerto Rico? Is that a consideration? There is uh, already was a, there was a petition and a letter that was sent to um, to the White House uh, with 100,000 signatures asking for intervention in that sense to fiscalize uh, the government's operations in Puerto Rico. The White House clearly stated that this is an internal affair of the Puerto Rican government. But let me just say this to you, uh, Gerson. There has been a team of officials from the Treasury Department in Puerto Rico for the last maybe six months, four months, and uh, I had a meeting with Secretary Liu, and I told, I told him quite bluntly that there was responsibility um, because of our own policies and that the government, the federal government, needed to do more than we have seen uh, to this point. They had been there providing technical assistance and they had been advising the government of Puerto Rico. The, this governor, the day that he made it Alejandro into office, yes, yes, assumed a, 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 a debt of almost $72 billion. He has implemented a lot of measures uh, to, uh, to get savings in, Puerto, in, 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 in the federal, uh, in the government operations. He reduced the public payroll from 140,000 to 89,000. He implemented pension reform with public service employees. This type of measures have been discussed by governors in Puerto Rico and never, never implemented at the level that this governor has done it. He increased the sales tax to 11.5 percent, the highest of any state in the United States. So he has been doing and taking actions uh, that are not popular. If so he, he runs for office tomorrow, he's going to lose. So, so he squeezes as much as he can. Yes. And that's why we heard that unexpected announcement, we can't pay the debt. He did it on Sunday. Congresswoman, uh, time is limited. I know you have a lot of things to do. What happens in Washington? Are there going to be hearings? Is there going? Is this going to get its day in the federal government before the House and the Senate? Well, uh, Nancy Pelosi, the leader of the Democrats, yesterday issued a statement asking Speaker Boehner uh, to bring the bill to the floor. And I think that uh, from now on, you're going to see a lot of um, voices out there putting pressure on Speaker Boehner and uh, members of Congress to, to act and to pass this legislation, uh, because there are not too many options. Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez representing District 7 here in New York City, New York State. Uh, wish you luck. Uh, certainly Puerto Ricans, I am, as you are, we're very concerned about what's happening. We've never seen a crisis like this in Puerto Rico, so we're hoping for the best and hoping at the same time that uh, logic prevails. And you know, one immediate action that the, that the president could uh, implement is to provide a waiver to the uh, Jones Act that will lower the cost of transportation of gas, petroleum, to Puerto Rico. And he could do that with an executive signature. That's right. executive. Okay. President Obama, you got your hands full. Here's another little problem you can resolve. He seems to be on a good streak. For City and State TV, I'm Herson Borrero. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank Best you. of luck. Thank, Thank you for you. being with us.